Hi, welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. Well, we continue our series with the Democratic candidates for governor, and then we're going to have Mary Wilson with Pennsylvania Public Radio. She's going to talk a little bit about Governor Corbett's plan to expand health care coverage to almost 600,000 Pennsylvanians. All of that follows these words. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, a fast-paced, unrehearsed weekly discussion with and about the leaders who shape your world. And now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. I welcome back to the program. Well, we're, we've invited the Democratic candidates. We have Katie McGinty on. I'm going to just talk about her in a second. Uh, as you know, Governor Corbett has been on this program. He's always invited. The incumbent governor is always welcome on this program. Kathleen McGinty, otherwise known as Katie. Now, look, I'm going to hold one thing against you. You went to St. Joe's you know, instead of F&M. What's You're that just about? Jealous. What's You're that? Jealous. No, it's a great school. The I want to say that. will never die. And then a chemistry major. <laughs> I can't figure this out. And then on to Columbia Law School. She was uh, 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 Department of Environmental Protection secretary when Governor Rendell was uh, in office. She also worked for. Uh, Vice President Al Gore and was an environmental advisor to President Clinton. I won't ask you if Bill is coming in to campaign for you. We could talk about that off camera or something. I've got my friends. You would like, you would lo <laughs> love to have him in. All right, look, uh, you're in office, you get elected, you take the oath of office. The first, first week you're in office, Katie McGinty, what do you tell the, the citizens of Pennsylvania about what you want to do? Uh, Terry, it's all about, <laughs> it's all about working families. Look, right. ninth of ten kids, my dad, a pol Philadelphia police officer, or my mom, a restaurant hostess, I know the value of a good job and I honor hard work and we're not creating those mm -hmm. jobs for Pennsylvania's families like we should, but we can. This should be Pennsylvania's time to shine. We've got terrific natural resources, a great workforce, great academic institutions like St. Joseph's University. I knew you were going to get that plug in. <laughs> we should be competing and winning today instead of falling behind. I know we can. Yeah. All right. Uh, you, you have a, a background. I mean, you've spent a good bit of your time in, in government. You've now been out of government for a while. You've had a chance to observe sort of you know, the intricacies of the policy making. And I don't want to get you into the details yet. We're not going to do that. But let's just sort of go through a couple of things. You, you were head of DEP. Your responsibility was to make sure the environment was clean and safe. But we also have this tension that goes on with natural, with energy production. We're a big energy production state. Do you think that we should continue to do fracking you know, the, the, the deep well drilling that takes place in our state, it's a big industry. And what would you say if the answer is yes to, you know, sort of your concerns about the environment that I know, obviously, given your career, you have? Yeah. Well, listen, Terry, I've worked, obviously, in government and also in the private sector and specifically in and around the energy industry and energy markets. A lot of work in renewable energy, but across the energy space, while protecting the environment. Right. So for me, the natural gas resource that we have is a significant opportunity, but we've got to have that environmental cop on the beat, if you will. We've got to have continuously improving standards uh, for the industry. So what? So that we are using less water, so that we're protecting water quality, and so that we're ensuring the proper handling of water that is produced in those operations. We can do all of that. All right. I think this governor has fallen short, and it's held us back economically, mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. because communities really are concerned. But you are for concerned. fracking. I mean, didn't you in indicate earlier that you think that it can still be done, but under, go ahead. Yes, no, absolutely. I mean, we can produce this resource and produce it responsibly and drive our economy. This governor, however, has taken the environmental cop off the beat and still has failed to achieve the economic result. Do you know that we have now fallen to where it's about one in two jobs in the shale industry in Pennsylvania go to non-Pennsylvanians? Mm -hmm. We've been losing those jobs. We've got to turn that around, grab those jobs, use the resource to drive high value added industries, not just to burn the gas, but we should be putting Pennsylvanians to work also in the chemicals industry, pharmaceuticals, life sciences that use the gas as a feedstock. 
All right, when we come back, we're going to run to a quick break. I want to talk with Katie McGinty about education. It's a huge issue in this state. It now ranks as the top priority for the Commonwealth. We talked with the voters of the state in the last couple of months about that. We'll be back after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business, and by the Pennsylvania Business Council Education Foundation, educating citizens and business leaders about important public policy issues and civic affairs. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by BetterSaferRoads.com. To voice your support for safer highways and less traffic congestion, visit BetterSaferRoads.com. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Uh, back to the show, uh, Democratic candidate for governor Katie McGinty joins me. We've invited all the Democratic candidates. They're welcome on this program as well as Governor Corbett. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, education. As, as you know, you know, we can make an argument about the stimulus and whether it was used to backfill the budget by Governor Rendell, as the governor's administration has said. But there isn't any doubt that school district after school district, this is reported in the news, this is factual, teacher layoffs, uh, music programs cut, library staffs cut. Uh, what's your sense about what uh, Katie McGinney administration would look like in terms of, let's just talk about basic education in the school, school districts. Yeah, Terry, I mean, absolutely. From uh, the perspective of my own role as a mom and seeing my own children in the public school system, you know, I see the cuts and I see no child being able to play uh, sports, for example, unless they can write a 50 or or $100 check. That leaves a lot of kids on the sideline and that's unacceptable. But the other thing, as a business person, I know one thing for sure. You never build your business in a place where the public school system is in flames. Yeah. Because the most important resource to a business that's investing is that human capital. Are they going to have talented kids and young adults coming up? We are putting out a sign that says Pennsylvania is not a good mm. place to do business, and so that's you, unacceptable. You would find, the you, you, you think that the education budget then should have been increased. That would be your position. Well, it should not have been slashed by 800 to 900 million dollars, Terry. You can't compete and win. Same thing with transportation. Yeah. You know, we're thousand bridges now in Pennsylvania. It's a yeah. disgrace that we can't yeah, move you goods across them. You anticipated where I was going to go. <laughs> We've had three governor's commissions, uh, two during a Rendell administration, one by a Corbin administration that recommended very sizable investments the Senate, as you know, passed the $2.5 billion, bipartisan, 45 to 5. This is Democrats and Republicans. I, when you get unions and the chambers of commerce saying we ought to do something, yeah, you think maybe it ought to happen. Do you support that 2.5? Not specifically that, but the, uh, uh, give us your sense about the need for roads, bridge improvement, and, of course, mass transit. You know, Terry, this governor seems to have a habit now of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. Yeah. Because whether it's on transportation, where we had bipartisan consensus about putting the money and the resources into that vital infrastructure that we absolutely need, and the governor walked away from it, mm -hmm. or even on the shale tax. Bipartisan support for a reasonable shale tax. Mm -hmm. The governor chose to cut a billion dollars out of education instead of putting in, putting in place a reasonable tax structure that the industry itself supported. Yeah. What we need to do is turn that around. Yeah. Well, the reason, oh, go ahead, finish your thought. Well, we absolutely need to invest in education, transportation, and my goodness, Uncle Sam's been trying to give us $40 billion for health care for the right. last two and a half years, and we're leaving that on the table, right. too. We need those resources to build and grow our economy and good paying jobs, and we need to do that now. Yeah, one of the things that sort of struck me is when it comes to roads and bridges, and it's a segue to what you talked about, when businesses want to come to a particular area, they want to look at the schools and the quality of the schools, but they also want to know if you have a transportation network that's capable of handling what they do. And just take the fracking and the natural gas, I mean, all of a sudden you have you know, large transportation vehicles and traffic on roads that weren't meant 
to be. And it seems logical. And again, we have Republicans and Democrats. This isn't a partisan thing saying we need to do something about that. So it's an economic imperative, it seems to me. And, you know, um, I, I can't be political. I can't be for a party, but I can certainly recognize a policy issue, sure. that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, listen, I, you need to be able to move goods and you need to be able to move them yeah. efficiency, efficiently, but you also need to be able to move people. And that's where it's not just roads and bridges, but it's mass transit yeah. as well. That's how people get to work. And it's also something that young people are looking for in terms of where they want to live. They want to live, work, right. play, not be dependent right. on a car. But I'll give you a story. Just this week, uh, visiting. Hold on, I'm going to uh, ask you to hold on to that story <laughs> because they're saying we got talk about business. We got to pay some bills. Okay, we'll get to Katie McGinty's story in a moment. We'll be back. <laughs> this broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Pennsylvania Credit Union Association. Pennsylvania Credit Unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you check out ibelong.org and by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Hospital and Health System Association of Pennsylvania working towards a healthy Pennsylvania. Hey, welcome back to the program. Well, the host interrupted. <laughs> Katie McKinty, go ahead, finish your story. Great story. <laughs> well, just how vital an efficient transportation system is. So sitting down with the CEO of a great business in Pennsylvania, they're putting people to work in manufacturing, great jobs. What's the problem? Yeah. Once they make the big, heavy equipment that they're manufacturing, they need to be able to move it. The company has suffered all kinds of liquidated damages because their right. equipment is either not getting to right. where it's supposed to go or arriving late. Yeah. We're not going to keep those businesses without these basics and fundamentals. This should have been done job one, day yeah. one with the bipartisan consensus we had. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, you, the one I noticed that just recently you we were, you're talking about working families zero, or you you think there ought to be a, a minimum wage increase. You want to talk about that and give you a chance to yeah, get thanks. your position out on that. Look, I think the big picture is we need to move money to to Main Street. One, increase that minimum wage. The studies now show hands down that the reason the economy is suffering is because wages haven't kept pace. People don't have purchasing power. Put money into the pockets of hardworking consumers, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, then we can unlock all of these billions of dollars sitting on Wall Street. Let's provide some tax incentives to give that money mm -hmm. and invest it in the local auto mechanic who wants to hire another guy or gal, or the local plumber who wants to bring on an air conditioning specialist. We could have smart tax policies that bring those dollars to grow Main Street businesses. And I think the third thing relative, related to this story I told too, we've got good businesses in Pennsylvania. I want to see a governor who has fire in the belly every day is going to be a partner with those CEOs and not a single job leaves this state mm -hmm. without a big fight. <laughs> but I don't see that in this governor mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. All right, before I let you go, we're going to have Mary Wilson come on here from uh, Pennsylvania Public Radio and get into the details of the health care expansion at Governor Corbett. It's controversial. It has a lot of moving parts. And I don't get it, you don't need to get into the details of it. Mary will. But w generally speaking, what would the – your governor, day one – the expansion, what would you do? Look, at when Uncle Sam is going to hand you $40 billion that you either take it or it's going to go to other states, you just say yes and you say yes immediately, mm -hmm. especially when, one, you get to offer decent and dignified health care right. coverage to 600,000 Pennsylvanians, and second, you have business groups, business groups around the state that have said that this will also create 40,000 new jobs in an industry where we've got a foothold and we can grow, and that is health care and life mm -hmm. sciences. This is one of these things you pray for to put in place immediately. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is just in terms of the dollars and cents of the budget, medical assistance is one of the biggest pieces of our general fund. We could lighten the load on Pennsylvania taxpayers by saying yes to this initiative and getting to work. 
All right. Hey, great having you on the program. Thanks for coming on. All right. Mary Wilson is coming up. We're going to talk about the details of the Medicaid-like. I use that word because it's not Medicaid expansion at Governor Corbett. It's been in the news. It's the big story of the week, and it's here next. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by Highmark Blue Shield, changing the way health plans work for business with a variety of plan options for employers and more choices for employees. Information is available at Highmark.com. Have a greater hand in your company's health. And by the Pennsylvania Healthcare Association, the future of long-term care. Hi, hey, welcome back to the program. Joining me is Mary Wilson with Pennsylvania Public Radio. Mary's a frequent guest on the program. She's been all over this covering the uh, health care expansion. Uh, I, I called it Medicaid L-I-K-E, like, because it's really not Pennsylvania participating in the Medicaid program, is it? That's, that's true, and, and you could, some would probably argue that it's Medicaid light. Um, yeah. I've heard L-I-T-E. Yeah, L-I-T-E. Yeah, okay, we got that. Um, so we've, we've got, yeah, a range of options here. Um, yeah, so what this is, is um, Governor Corbett has said, I will um, take federal money to subsidize health care coverage for low-income Pennsylvanians, but I've got some conditions. Okay. And, and he said this in the past, that he, he would not um, engage in any, anything that looks like an expansion of Medicaid as authorized under the federal health care law unless he gets certain reforms to right. the Medicaid program, which he thinks is an unsustainable um, entitlement program for Long the state. Long term is his concern, right? Even though it would be fully paid for Medicaid 100% and then 90%, right. his argument down the road. Yeah, what about that 10% that the state has to pony up? What if, you know, you or hear this from every... Or 30 down the road. Right, what if the federal government can't pony up as much money as it right. said it could? Um, so his plan is to make... So, so what we were waiting for this week is what are those reforms going to be? What does he propose? Um, so he said on Monday um, that he wants to change the, you know, in, in broad strokes, he wants to change the benefit packages um, available under Medicaid. Okay. Um, he used the word simplify pretty much. Um, and it's not clear exactly what benefits are going to go away. Um, he also wants to get rid of co-payments, which he called confusing, and require monthly premiums for people enrolled in Medicaid. Monthly premiums that would be based on their income. Okay. So a ranging from zero to 25 bucks a month for a single person, for a family, ranging from zero to 35 bucks a month for like a family of four. So he thing. wants see th these kinds of changes. Now let me, I'm gonna walk through this and you tell me okay. if I'm right. So under his program, we would get money from the federal government through the Affordable Care Act, that money would be given, let's say Mary Wilson is a, would be eligible. Mary Wilson would take the money, go into the private marketplace using the federal ex, uh, insurance exchange that Pennsylvania and other states are part of, and then Mary Wilson would buy coverage herself using that dollar. Is that do I, Yeah, is that's pretty much right. That's the second right? that's the second part of this plan. So yeah. once he gets all the reforms to Medicaid that I he get wants. It. Oh, and, wait a minute. You're telling me if he doesn't get the reforms to Medicaid that he wants that you were describing, he won't even buy into the second piece. He says of it? if and only if. If and only if he gets these reforms, which also include controversially a work search requirement you for to, people who are able bodied and of working age. Um, you have to be actively working for actively searching for a job, a job, or you won't get, you wouldn't be eligible for Medicaid. Right. Wow. Right. You know what? I'll tell you something. That's, I didn't put those pieces together, and I thought I was following this, but that's good uh, thing I'm here. See, now the good thing you're here. <laughs> no, this is this is important. I mean, I thought regardless of those reforms, you, he would still say we're going to take the federal government's money. You, Mary Wilson, get on the insurance exchange. You're eligible for it by the coverage. Right. And that's what most of the debate is. I mean, not the uh, discussion has been about, no? He says if and only if. That's what he said on Monday. He wants these wow. reforms and then will pivot to creating, um, to accepting federal money to subsidize private health care plans that will be, that I people can it. shop for in the yeah. federally created health care exchange in the and, state. And they're supposed to start on October 1, right? Right. The exchanges. Right. The full... 
participation in the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare doesn't start till January 1. That means that people could actually, you know, get, get, right. get you know, you buy coverage or you pay a fine right. if, you're, if you fall into that category, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, there, when we think about that second phase of the plan, um, the private, the private health care that people would be able right. to buy, you ask, who, who are these people? These are the people that between 100% and 133, 38% of um, the federal poverty level. These are people who um, would have been able to enter Medicaid under a typical expansion. Instead, right. these people will be eligible for private health care plans, um, federally subsidized. There's a bone of contention here. Some people say, you know, a lot of people say, look, private health care is not as cheap as Medicaid. How would this save anybody? Yeah. How would this save the state money? But there are several analysts who say that the costs will even it, out. Well, but the point is, if you go into the private exchanges, you will pay more and probably get less coverage because of Medicaid, you know, the specific payments to hospitals and doctors, you know, and the health care providers that wouldn't necessarily be true for the private marketplace. Right. You may get, you may get fewer benefits. You, um, there's, you know, there's got to be profit in the private health care plan. So even if there's competition, yeah. there's got to be profit yeah. among those companies that are competing for sure, those people. Sure, sure. But then Absolutely. again, you've got doctors who yeah. might be more willing to accept those kinds of patients because the reimbursement rates are higher for those All right, the governor plans. says he thinks, for, well, there are two questions. We've got about a minute and a half. Question one, uh, HHS, Health and Human Services, has not accepted these modifications to Medicaid in the past. Any indication at all that, that Kathleen Sebelius, you know, the sec they're going to buy into the first part piece of this? That is a great question. <laughs> And when the you know the answer, and That's when the it. secretary of public welfare is asked that question, she says this is the beginning of a negotiation process. Okay, now let's go to the second question. Governor said he can do this without the legislature. We already have reaction. Hardline conservatives, and I'll say liberal Democrats, just the way to describe it. Sure. Neither of them are happy about it for different reasons. Right. right? Hardline conservatives don't want the commitment at all don't want us to join Medicaid expansion at all. Mm -hmm. Liberals say it goes too far. I mean, it doesn't go far enough. It doesn't extend the coverage to the people in the way it should, the private plans. Does this require legislative action or haven't you been able to determine that yet? Well, uh, the states are able to, the states, in the law, I believe it says states are allowed to challenge right. an expansion. I got it. But they don't have to approve it. They, they are able to pass a law okay. that rejecting so, it. So, in other words, that's uh, something to be decided yet about the legislators' role. All right, I'm glad you came on this program because I think you clarified that, and that was, maybe it was just the host isn't very smart, I don't know. All right, we'll see you next week for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, stay well.